Okay. Welcome everyone. Today we're going to start emotional intelligence. Session one will go over some of the background, the theory of emotional intelligence. Two weeks from today, when you come back from spring break, we'll do some exercises to help us practice these emotional intelligence techniques. I find emotional intelligence very important to communication. I don't think there's really anything that dictates how effectively you communicate with someone else than how well you're managing your own emotions and how well you're understanding their emotions. So let's get a couple definitions of emotional intelligence just so we understand how we put all this into context. Let's start off with this one. Emotional intelligence is the ability to use, understand, and manage emotions in positive ways to reduce stress, communicate effectively, empathize, overcome challenges, and defeat conflict. Sounds like good stuff, right? If you're able to do all that stuff. So identify, use, understand your emotions. Understand when you're angry and how that's going to affect your ability to communicate. If you're really frustrated and stressed out, this may not be the best time to have a check-in with your boss about some things that you would rather you know, see different, things you want to see different. If you're frustrated about something that happened with the copier machine, you may not want to take that out on a client. So understand how that's going to affect you and manage that in a positive way to do all that good stuff. Another definition for us to think about. If you have high emotional intelligence, you're able to recognize your emotional state, the emotional state of others, and engage in the people, and engage with people in a way that draws them to you. We want to do that as well, right? Did you all take a look at that video, the Daniel Goleman video, a little bit? Were you impressed with what you saw in terms of how emotional intelligence might help you in your business lives? A little bit, anybody sort of on the fence, maybe? Uh, what video are you talking about? There was a, a video link to Daniel Goleman, the founder of Emotional Intelligence from the business standpoint, explaining why it's important to use emotional intelligence in a business setting. He went over such things as this. It will help you. It, there, that video was on the syllabus, right? Yeah. Video link? Okay. All right, you, you can check it out later. All right. As I mentioned, uh, Daniel Goleman in 1995 popularized emotional intelligence for the business world. It was developed a few years earlier by someone else. But what the business world liked about the way Daniel Goleman framed all this is he put it into how we can be effective business people context. He said, look, everything comes down to effective job performance in terms of how we use this technique, how we use this stuff. Granted, there are other uses for it, but let's just look at it in the context of effective job performance. And he did some studies, and he says, what contributes to effective job performance? Is it IQ, how smart you are? Well, being smart is helpful, but we've all had examples of managers who are really smart, coworkers who are really, really smart, but just not good at their jobs for one reason or another. Next question. Does it come down to job skills? Maybe you're not the smartest, sharpest knife in the drawer, but you really know your job? OK, this could be more important. And Goldman found that it tended to be a little bit more important. But still, it was not as important as emotional intelligence. Your ability to relate to the people around you, especially if you're a manager, your ability to inspire subordinates, he did a couple of different studies, and I don't completely understand or want to get into too much of an explanation of how he cut the data, but he said that emotional intelligence accounts for between 62 and 85% of effective job performance. Your ability to manage your emotions and communicate effectively with people because of your understanding of those emotions affects your job performance, the way you relate to clients, the way you relate to associates, managers, the way you communicate the needed business information that you need to communicate. There are a number of ways to break up emotional intelligence to categorize the different parts of it. 
I like looking at it in terms of three parts. They are self-awareness, understanding what's going on with you, how that's going to affect your ability to communicate, emotional management. All right, if you're really angry, you're really frustrated, you just hate talking to someone, how can you manage that in a way that's not going to hurt your job performance? And then thirdly, can you take that self-awareness understanding, your ability to manage your emotions, and interact effectively with other people? Those are the three categories, the three buckets I like to put emotional intelligence in. And I think that'll frame our discussion as we look at some abstract examples. I think emotional intelligence is re relevant to communication. I really think nothing is more important than understanding your own, own emotions in terms of how you communicate. If you're nervous, if you're frustrated, if you're mad, that's going to affect the way you communicate. That's the first step. The second step is understanding what your audience might be going through. Are they afraid they're going to lose their job? So when you come into their office and ask them about increasing their job performance, are they going to freak out? How can you manage that? How can you work with them in order to refine your message, the word choice you use? Anything we've learned in this class, the eye contact, the body language, it's all just a tool to effectively connect with your audience. And your emotions, I think, plays into that more than anything. So, a couple things. Let's go ahead and go to this quick little exercise I like to do to think about the job skills, characteristics of good managers you've had or bad managers you've had. And we'll think about how this fits into our emotional intelligence discussion. So what I'd like you to do is to go through this thought process with me. Think of the best manager you've ever had, and also think of the worst manager you've ever had. And then I'd like you to write down the top three attributes the best manager you've ever had had. And I would also like you to write down the top three attributes that the worst manager you ever had had. All right, so you're going to start thinking about that. There's a self, uh, uh, there's a workbook. You can put those, yes. You can write those in. And I've got some little stickies I'm going to come around with. And I'm going to have you put each of those six words on a little sticky. And we're going to do an exercise to see where this all matches up with, with our emotional intelligence discussion. But while I prepare for that, you go ahead and write the top three attributes of your best manager, top three attributes of your worst manager. I'll put two words out of this. <laughs> I, uh, you, could, you could do a number of things. You could pick one. You could write six attributes for worst managers, and I could give you extra stickies. That's definitely something you could do. Well, let's do this. Take, I'm going to pass around these stickies. Take six of them and, and pass them on to the next person.
kind of screen. What's that? It's all going to erase. Like someone, it's not necessarily because they're stupid, not necessarily because they can't do their job, but because they are rude, hypocritical, impulsive, condescending, irritable, arrogant, insensitive. Similarly, the things that thing that makes you feel really inspired by someone, 
is the way they relate to you because they're in control of their emotional intelligence. And they're calm, supportive, trusting, they care, team-oriented, they have leadership, caring, trust, proactive, considerate, sympathetic. Right? Emotional intelligence provokes that kind of response from people who are subordinate to you. Similar to Goldman's results, I'd say about somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of job performance. In this instance, job performance is cultivating a good team or making your employees like or dislike you, seems to be related to emotional intelligence. So let's think of these three different categories. Remember, I like to categorize emotional intelligence in terms of self-awareness, emotional management, and social management. So let's think, what do we have if we have each of those? And we're going to start with self-awareness. If you have self-awareness, what good things does that bring to your job performance? One, understanding of emotional effects. If you're angry, how's that going to affect your ability to communicate? If you walk into a situation, a room that makes you nervous, what things do you need to be aware of so you don't do something impulsive or something that's counterproductive to your career. Congruent verbal and nonverbal. What does that mean? What do I mean by that? Right. I mean, you, sorry, you um, say in your body language is portraying the same thing. You're not saying, saying I'm not angry, but acting angry. Yeah, how about that? Slap you want to be a person who says, I'm not angry, but act angry? Is that going to make someone like you? Make someone want to work for you and put you under the, uh, the best manager? No. You want to be congruent with your verbal and nonverbal. You want to be, for lack of a better term, at peace with yourself and clear about what you're trying to communicate. Uh, let me put these next three up as a unit. If you have self-awareness, you have awareness of needs, strengths, and weaknesses. You also have awareness of your values and goals. With that awareness, comes a, a sense of acceptance and confidence. So let's break those down. Aware of your strengths and weaknesses. Aware of how you fit in with a team. How you can contribute. What you might need help with. Needs. Now, if you're not aware that you have needs, does that mean you don't have needs? Do your needs go aware if you're not? Do your needs go away if you're not aware of them? being facetious. You still have needs. If you just don't acknowledge them, then that can lead to some incongruent messages for those around you. That can lead to some passive aggressive behavior. That can lead to some things that are detrimental to your ability to interact with others. Similarly with values and goals. You know what's important to you. You know what your values are. Have you ever worked with someone who just really doesn't? They might find themselves in a situation that they're uncomfortable with. They don't know why. They don't know how to explain it. Have any of you found yourself in a situation like that? that well, one of the things I wrote for the worst was inconsistent. Uh, I think that could be lack of awareness of values. OK, lack of awareness of what's important to them. Yeah. So this analysis will put you at more peace with yourself, for lack of a better term. Also help you explain to those around you how you can make a contribution to the team. If you have a weakness that you don't fully understand, and you're always trying to pretend it's not a weakness, that's going to cause some problems. But an understanding of this will bring this sense of self-awareness, self-acceptance, and confidence. All right, so those are some things I think you have if you have self-awareness move on to the next category, emotional management. If you're able to develop this skill of emotional management, you'll have a number of good things as well. The first and foremost being rational thought. We want to have rational thought, right? We don't want to be so frustrated, so stressed, that we lose control of our ability to think rationally. And that's what often, often happens. When you get nervous, you get angry, and then an hour later, a day later, you think, man, I really shouldn't have called my boss, uh, yada, yada, yada. I really shouldn't have told so-and-so that they were going to be fired. Now they're all nervous. I just was mad. 
I didn't think this through rationally. So I'm going to manage that emotion and think of the best way to communicate. In addition to emo emotional management, let me bring up a few things. Resilience, patience, flexibility. All right, let's start with these three. So if every time you encounter some sort of emotional roadblock, if every time you get frustrated, you lose your ability to bounce back, you lose your ability to be patient, and you say, no, I can't be flexible, it has to be this way. I got upset this morning, and so now my whole day is ruined. You need to be able to work through that in a way that you can bounce back with some resiliency, that you can be patient because it didn't work out this time, maybe it's going to work out next time, and you can be flexible. It doesn't have to be the way you planned it. You need to manage these little road bumps that come up and work through the emotions with that. The ability to do that, I think, gives you a sense of confidence. I don't know what I'm going to encounter when I walk into this board meeting, but I know I'm going to be able to manage my emotions if somebody throws something at me that frustrates me or confuses me. I'm going to be able to be resilient, patient. I'm going to be flexible. My manager said one thing one day and then something else another day. I'm going to manage my EQ part of this. Motivation. I also like to put motivation in with emotional management. And my thinking on this is that we are all motivated. We all have goals, desires, things we want to accomplish. The question is, how well can we handle the little setbacks that come up in achieving our goal? What prevents us from achieving our goal, so much of the time, are these frustrating things that lead to frustrating emotions. And I think being able to unpack a lot of that will just remind you how important your goals are to you. Important what you're trying to do, how important it is that you accomplish this or that. And the thing that prevents us so much of the time is this frustration that we can't control. Lastly, physical and mental health. We're stressed out all the time. It's going to affect our health. We want to manage that effectively. We don't want to be stressed out all the time. We want to be aware of what we're frustrated by and think about how we can manage that emotion and put it into a healthy conversation, get to the gym, work out, realize this is just not the time for me to be making that phone call. This is just not the time for me to be replying to that email. I need to go to the gym and get some, some stress off my neck. So, this is the emotional management category. Lynn. Would the word control put in anywhere over there? Uh, you mean like we would have control? Yeah. Sure. I could go with that. So, rational thought, ability to control when our emotions want to take us away from that rational thought. Yeah, it's not necessarily repressing your feelings. It's not saying that you're not going to be true to what you're feeling and express what you need to express honestly. It's thinking about what's the best way for you to do that in a way that's going to work best for you. Social management. What do we have? We have the ability to manage our social lives, manage our social interactions. Number one, empathy. What does empathy mean? Vanessa. The ability to put yourself in someone else's place is the attempt to so that you can understand what they're going through. Yes. Understand what they're going through. The ability to feel their pain. Think, gosh, they must be worried about losing their job right now. And their kid is you know, in rehab, so they must be stressed out about that too. So that's probably the reason they're acting this way. I need to understand that and relate to that effectively. We all have empathy. We can all empathize. Empathy is an important part of the human social experience. We can look across the room and we can see somebody make it a little paper cut on their finger and we just kind of like, dude, that really that must have hurt. Like I, I feel that pain. We feel that and we understand that in a way that other species don't. And that's been an important part of our social development. We're social human beings. We can feel that empathy. We just need to tap into it. 
insight. So I empathize with you. I understand you're going through pain. What does that mean for the analytical way I'm going to approach you? What insight can I glean from that? Should I ask you a very gentle question? Should I make a very clear statement? Should I send you an email? Should I make a phone call? What insight can I glean from my empathetic understanding? And lastly, how can I relate to you? So first, just, I may have confused these a little bit. So first, can you empathize? Second, what do you understand from that empathy? And thirdly, how am I going to relate to you? How am I going to think about interacting with you because I empathize and because I have insight about what you're going through? So those are the three buckets, the three categories. Any questions so far? Let's think about putting those in context with some examples. Some examples that may resonate with things you've experienced in your lives. I've got a number of questions, descriptions of things people do, things you might have done. As we go through each of them, I want you to think about, does the person who does this, are they a high emotional intelligence person, a high EQ person, or are they a low emotional intelligence person? And I also want you to think about which of the three categories would this attribute or skill fit into? So let's take a look at the first one. Imagine this person. This person says to you, I change my tone and behavior depending on who I am interacting with. So first question, is this a high EQ person or a low EQ person? In what category do you put it in? High EQ. High EQ. Excellent. In what category? Social management. Social management? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I change my beliefs and values depending on who I'm interacting with. Right. One, one person. Maybe, there's, there's a ton of these. We get at least one for everybody. If we get tired of it, we can just skip it. Uh, one person. Is high EQ or low EQ? What category does it fit in? Yeah? I feel the low EQ. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Something with confidence or self awareness? Uh, okay. Yeah, so I could go with a little self-awareness. Might go a little, a little social management as well. All right, so I would say this is a low EQ person, self-awareness and social management. You don't want to change your values and beliefs, but you do want to change your tone and behavior. If necessary, I can be courteous to a person I dislike. So how do we describe that person? Is that someone who's just not really in touch? Is always being fake? Jenny? I think um, that's high EQ in terms of self-management. Okay, I agree with that. I was being facetious. I don't think that's someone who is being fake. I think that is someone who is managing their emotions effectively and interacting in a way socially. It's going to be positive. Yeah, I just feel that uh, I don't know any character that can be more than Sure, if necessary, I can be so really frustrated, and I'm not going to let this frustration get the better of me and ruin my career. Yeah. I'm going to talk to this person, and I'm going to get the information I need, and then I'm going to go back to my office and never talk to them again, hopefully. I avoid difficult conversations, even if having those conversations is necessary and important. Great. That's low. Yeah, which, which category? Um, trying to be self-aware, but... Yeah, er everything is a little self-awareness, but it's also... Mm, it's not social management, though, right? Because... It could be. I think there's no right answer to this one. I might say a little more emotional management, because... Okay. These, these feelings might come up when you have to have a difficult conversation. You may not like having a difficult conversation. You have to tell someone they're getting written up, tell someone they're getting fired, tell someone you, you, know, you don't want to date them anymore. These are things that stress all of us out. Are you going to be able to manage that emotion and interact effectively? So I think it's a 
big part of emotional management, also a little part social management, and of course self-awareness affect, affects everyone. When I become occupied with a negative thought, I cannot concentrate on anything else until it is resolved. Josh? What do you do? And uh, I guess uh, part of the emotional management. Yeah, I would say that. We have these negative things come up, and we function and do our jobs in the meantime. Are we able to compartmentalize? Do our best to deal with it. Sure, there's going to be a little stress in the meantime, but I still need to move forward. When things get bad, I like to look at the bright side. Sure. I think it's high with emotional management. Yes. Yes. That's what I would say. High and emotional management. I think this is really important. I used to be the person who did not like this person. Someone who always had something positive to say. Oh, well. Three tires are flat, but at least there aren't four tires flat. Strangle that person. But it happened. All three tires are flat. All right, how can we look at this, maybe not necessarily with a positive spin, but how can we be resilient and patient and flexible? And maybe things will work out a little bit better. I used to also, I hate, I used to hate people who used to say things work out for the best or things, things happen for a reason. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. That used to drive me crazy. Things happen for a reason. Hey, yeah, there's a flat tire happened for a reason. <laughs> there's a piece of glass on the street. That's why it happened. No, there's some higher purpose. Well, there's not necessarily a higher purpose unless you look at the best situation possible, unless you take action to be resilient, be flexible, be patient, and make the best you can of the situation. Think about this one all the time. I mentioned to you my career background. I had a number of different careers before, ending up doing what I'm doing now, acting, finance, and now doing more coaching and teaching. I think my ability to be flexible and look at the bright side of each of those first two careers that didn't work out exactly as I planned helped me get to where I wanted to be. And I could still be crying about how I'm not a movie star. And that really wouldn't do me any good. I'm good at expressing my emotions and telling people how I feel. High EQ, low EQ? Helen? I think it's high EQ because it says the good at. Yeah, okay. Uh. <laughs> well, I'm good at yelling at people. Uh. What if I were to say that? No. That would be, that'd be low EQ. But I would agree this is a high EQ. If you don't understand why you're frustrated, if you're not able to verbalize in a socially acceptable way, well, I didn't really like it when you left me alone for three hours at the party. You know, because I felt like I have these needs and these values. Right? If I'm able to explain that to you carefully, then that's going to be positive for our relationship. If I'm not, I'm just going to be mad all the time. That's probably going to be negative for our relationship. I would actually think that this is a situational. I mean, sometimes verbalizing everything is probably not the best choice. Yeah, yeah. I wanted, why don't you take this next one for you? If I am angry at someone, I need to immediately tell them how I feel. That's really low, low that I would say. Yeah, yeah. You can do that with your family members, not, not at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't even do that with your family members well, all the time. Depends. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it depends. Okay, so to Priya's point that you brought up, there's you know, two sides of every coin. Just because you're angry, just because you need to express something, doesn't mean you need to do it right then and there, in front of the whole management team, in front of, the, in front of my subordinates, right in the middle of the party. Now let's wait until we're able to think rationally about this and wait until we're able to have a constructive conversation about this. I say things that I regret. Eric? Okay, so do you want to say things that you regret? It depends on who I will talk to. Okay, well, the, the very fact that you regret it means later you say, I wish I hadn't said that. So, so embedded in my question is you 
in your rational mind, after you say it, think, you know, that probably wasn't the best thing for me to say. It wasn't the best thing for me to do. The reason you might have said it is because you were mad, you weren't thinking clearly, you were stressed, you were nervous. This is the key thing we want to avoid. Now, people who have high emotional intelligence, they don't necessarily say nice things all the time. That's a misnomer. Sometimes they say very clear things that don't seem nice, but they think carefully about the best way to communicate that. Sometimes they have to have very difficult, hard conversations. But what people with high EQ avoid is saying things that they regret. Because they always understand what's going on with them, what's going on with their audience, and the best way to communicate that. And they do not want to say things they regret. Let me. Um, the fact that you realize that you regret it is a sign of high EQ. Okay. Okay. Good. Right. Did you realize you regret it? Okay, fair enough. I will not argue that. <laughs> so, I would say the less you can find yourself saying, I really regret that, the higher IQ you higher EQ you are. Fair enough? So it's an after the fact, after the fact you know. I often think about the ethical implications of my actions. Johnny? I think this uh, could be either way. This is kind of similar to uh, what I was talking about. Um, the fact that you're able to re-examine your decisions is a sign of uh, IQ. And I think uh, to this kind of, um, it, it's, it, it's, you know, it's got two sides. Um, on the one hand, the fact that you have this mechanism into ethical, ethically difficult situations, that, that, that's potentially a problem. Um, for this question, though, I feel like there's no, uh, there's no uh, implication that you are. It's just, it's, it's in the present moment, right? I, I, you know, I could really use this Dell computer. I, I want to take it home with me. <laughs> but I'm going to think about the ethical implications of doing that. Right? That's stealing. Stealing is wrong. Or that, you know, I'm, I'm really thirsty. I need to, I need to like, get a drink of water. I'm gonna, gonna, gonna think about the ethical implications. And you stop yourselves from doing things that aren't not ethical. So this is a high EQ person. Which category do we think it fits into? What's that? A little bit of everything. Okay, a little bit of everything. Self-awareness. Self-awareness, yes. I would agree definitely. All of this fits into a little bit of everything, but I think there's one that is especially valuable for us to discuss on this point. It's social awareness. The fact that you think about how what you do is going to affect someone else makes you socially aware, it makes you have that emotional intelligence that you can empathize and understand what's going on around you. Not someone who is just mindlessly causing trouble without realizing it for other people. Uh, I like to keep trying the worthwhile things even if I get frustrated at first. Eric? It's high. And it's kind of a side of self awareness and emotional madness. Okay. So yeah. It's some values of the goals and also some patience and self motivation. Perfect. Fantastic. This is a high EQ person. This person who's aware of their goals and their values and what's worthwhile to them. And they're not going to let a little roadblock throw them away, throw them off their, uh, throw them off their chosen path. My friends and family members sometimes make offhand remarks that I find intensely annoying. Second. And it's a low EQ. And I think that this is uh, about to do with Okay, a little, a little I'd say emotional management. Yeah, both of them. All right, if you go on a family vacation, 
okay, you know, your friends and family members are going to make offhand remarks. All right, are you going to sit in the car and be frustrated, or are you going to be able to manage that emotion? And think of a way to have a constructive conversation if necessary. I can tell when someone I'm talking with gets nervous, and I do my best to make them feel relaxed. Vanessa? Say hi to you and have social awareness. I'd agree. I've noticed that I have compulsive habits like biting nails or overeating, but I don't know why I have them, and I cannot seem to stop. Jared? Uh, low. I think self-awareness. Yeah. I think low EQ, and I think self-awareness is the key point here. Right. Why am I constantly biting my nails? Let me think about why, think about what's going on that I can address that's going to decrease that anxiety. I'm aware of which types of professional situations and social situations make me, that make me feel uncomfortable. I'm aware of which types that make me feel uncomfortable. Frank? Uh, high EQ for the self-awareness. Yes, high EQ, self-awareness. You need to understand this. You're not necessarily going to manage all your anxiety. Your anxiety is not going to go away just because you get nervous during job interviews. But you need to understand how that affects you and how you can prepare for that. But Would that also be a sign to some degree of low EQ the fact that there are situations that feel I would say no, just because of what I just said. That it's understandable you're going to get nervous. In a job interview, just because you get nervous doesn't mean you have low EQ. It means you care. It means you want something. It means you have goals. It means you want to make a good impression on your audience, and you care about making a good impression on your audience. You're going to feel natural emotions. I mean, this is not this is not a course in how we distance ourselves or strip away those natural emotions to your anxiety. This is a course in Understanding that that happens, how can we best deal with it? Makes sense. Yeah, but people, let's say if you just take two people and one person is more nervous in situations and one person is more, or is not nervous, is more self confident, wouldn't that be a sign of harm to two for that set of person? Okay, so I guess we're getting into some new lines this year. So one person is more nervous. I might suggest that the person who is less nervous has gone to the EQ. Workshop. They know their strengths, their weaknesses. They know what they need to prepare for for that job interview. They know that they have emotional management skills. If the interviewer throws them a trick question, they know they can take a deep breath and deal with that. So I might say that person has higher EQ as a result. If maybe the scenario you're posing is both people have identical EQ training, identical background, and one just happens to have a little more. Uh, Anxiety that registers on the EKG scale. I, I, I don't really know the answer to that. No, but I mean the way I would view it is they just say you get one to a hundred. So you don't need to be a hundred to have half EQ. You know. A uh, hundred. What's a hundred? Uh, let's just say. Yeah. Hundred, let's just, no, a no, hundred would be like the highest level. Of, of EQ. Yeah, I think even if somebody has high EQ, there's different levels of okay. Okay. where you are. So. Somebody who's legislative level 100, whatever, the highest level, they wouldn't be nervous. Somebody who is aware of what type of situations they're in, they may be at level 80, but they're still on, the, let's say, the higher end of the EQ spectrum. Whereas somebody who's not aware at all, they would be on the lower end. Does that make sense to say? So, where are you saying the, the unaware person is not nervous? No, the unaware person is nervous, and therefore is way at the bottom. Uh... Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure what we're talking about, to be perfectly last, but I'm about to move on just to say that, that this EQ understanding will decrease anxiety in my opinion. Uh, I insist on doing things my way. Frank? Yeah, uh, I think it depends on the outcome as well. You know, uh, there are many uh, great scientists have many uh, important findings, and there are many uh, uh, successful entrepreneurs. They are doing things in fact. Mm -hmm. So if the output is good. Okay, I guess so what you're saying, what if we told Steve Jobs he had to compromise? Yeah. Right? I would not be holding an iPhone right now. <laughs> now do people like working with Steve Jobs? <laughs> Often no. <laughs> so so this this I put this up and I, I guess the academic 
part of my brain wants to say this is a low EQ person and this has to do with social management. And let's be aware of that, always. But let's keep in mind right, that it's good to have goals, it's good to insist on doing things that are important to you and that you're confident in, but when you're doing them, think about using some good EQ skills. Zach? I think this has a lot to do a lot with IQ too, because just like he said, trying to on good entrepreneurs and scientists, they do things that are not exactly socially very uh, recognizable many times, especially the disruptive entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And but they are much more visionary people, mm -hmm. which I think the society does do not understand un until the results come out. Only the very few people understand them. It has a lot mm -hmm. to do with IQ. Okay, okay, absolutely. I would not disagree with that, but I would just say as you're doing that, realize how that, what effect that might have on your investors, what effect that might have on the people that are working for you, yeah. and how you want to manage that. Uh, I try to ignore negative feelings. Vanessa. Hey, well, I think awareness. Yes, absolutely. We're going to have negative feelings, we can't stop them, but just awareness. Uh, wait, 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 hold on. Yes. <laughs> so you have negative feelings. Okay. Okay. Just a disclaimer. I'm very, very cute. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I like to just. I don't like. I don't like to justify. It. If you have negative feelings, isn't one way of dealing with it ignoring it? Because let's say not an important issue is going to go away if you ignore it. If you address it, it may just make it a big issue. Okay. Uh, you could read that far into it, and I, I would not necessarily disagree with that. Remember the discussion Brian and I had earlier, where if you are upset by something, do you just have to sell, tell someone about it right away, or can you compartmentalize it and say, let me deal with that later. Let me send a well thought out email in a couple of days, or let me have a conversation next time I see that person face to face. Let me think about doing it that way. Just completely ignoring it. Maybe you're still going to be mad about that, but you're just trying to completely ignore it. And if you're still mad about it, it's going to express itself somehow. I would suggest. I would suspect. All right. Good discussion, though. Good, good job thinking of those nuances. I think people usually have selfish or bad intentions. Low EQ. Which category would you put? Social management, all right. I think low EQ, social management. So if every time someone bumps into you on an elevator, do you naturally think they're doing that to make you mad? Or do you realize, oh, they didn't see me there. Oh, they have this perspective, and that's just the way everyone fit into the elevator. I'm not going to jump to think that everyone's out to get me just because of an action that got in my way. Vanessa. This is actually just a question. I think we're Probably more, you know, to, uh, more balanced approach will be high too. 
But that's it. Vanessa, maybe we could go back to one of these. Is it is it this one we can we can talk more carefully about, or is there another one we can use as a template for this discussion? It's one thing I don't Okay, I'd say things that I reflect. Okay, that's good. So, so if we go to the workshop and realize all the crappy things we've done in our professional lives, yeah. that makes us self-aware. So just because we have a long list of things that we wish we had done differently, right. doesn't mean we're low EQ. In fact, it means we're high EQ. Right. Well, can I, can I, can I yeah. Yeah. I can bring it to that. A lot of people, when they're some people are just content. They just say right away. But then they're not not low on EQ. They immediately they realize that I, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. But it's just the the mindset that they had at that point. Okay, yeah. but yeah, but when when they got hot headed, they lost rational thought. Yeah. yeah. So at that point, they are low EQ. But then I mean, immediately they get on a high point, and I think that's that's the thing. As a person, you can't say low IQ or high IQ. Okay. So you're saying because they realized that it was a bad thing, they have a, a certain level of EQ. Right, that, that's what I was trying to get at. So yeah. I will not argue that. Okay, okay. I will not argue that. But that person could definitely benefit from an EQ workshop. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me give you an example. I was at this weird thing happened at a party I was at last weekend, an Oscars party. And after the Oscars, uh, there was about maybe 10, 12 of us in the room, all friends of the host named Alyssa. Uh, she was discussing something about the dynamics of what Chris Rock was saying, yada yada, and someone said something, and then she said something, and then her friend of like 10 years said, got up, got really mad, and said, you know what, Alyssa, F you, you cut me off, I'm out of here. <laughs> and he storms out. This is like her best friend in front of, you know, nine or 10 of her other friends, says F you at the end of her party that she hosts at the Oscars. And then 30 seconds later, <laughs> He comes back, he's like, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed, uh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so it's good that you recognize that. But do you think I'm inviting that guy to my Oscars party? So in that case, people still qualify as people. Yes. Okay. You, don't, so you, you don't want to stand up and say, F you, even if you say you're sorry, yeah. 30 I mean, seconds later. Credibility, credibility at that point. <laughs> yeah. Even as a manager said, if you think, you what, know, what if you did something like that in a business meeting? Right? Right. Is someone going to hire you to stand up in front of their investors? Right. Is someone going to hire you to represent them? Yeah, I think the, the level of EQ that people recognize that they're they say incredible things, the level of their EQ is only high in compared to people who are completely oblivious. You say, you say something uh, you know, that's inappropriate. Okay, yes, I like it. So, I like it. so there's three categories. There are people, there are people very low IQ, EQ, who don't realize what they did was wrong. There are people who do things that are irrational and kill their careers and their social interactions, but then they realize afterwards why it happened. And then there are people who don't lose their temper and interact with the way that, that makes people invite them back to their Oscar party and hire them for jobs. I think that's much, it's much more digestible because then they're like, wait, if I'm self-aware, then that implies that I have some, some so I like a category of like either high or low instead of just yeah. non-existent because then it's like wait, that is Okay. Fair, fair enough. What, what do you think, Debbie? Does that work in? Well, that, that's what kind of what you just said. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm just trying to figure out that third, that middle. So we've got none up at none. Okay, none. None. Okay. I mean, I think you know everyone who's in this class is operating somewhere in the, in the middle, and we're trying to elevate ourselves. Whereas the bottom category, I think they're just beyond. So they're in denial. They're completely, you know, oblivious of the fact that they, you know, exactly they rub people the wrong way. So I think we just and the thing is, they probably constitute a very small percentage of the general public. So it's a so 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 irrelevant. Good point, Johnny. All right. So now we have three categories instead of just high and low. We have none, low, and high. 
So how about this one? Uh, I think people will disagree. If I think people will disagree with me, I don't express my opinion. Your rhetorical control. If, uh, if I think people will disagree with me, I don't express my. All right, we got one vote for highest. No. Got one vote for low. I have highest. No, I think we're seeing sort of split. All right, let's hear from the lows. Who wants to make that argument? Let well, you should have self-confidence just because I'm being rigid. It doesn't mean your opinion is not worth anything. Yeah. You should be able to express yourself in a socially acceptable way. And you need to develop those skills to understand that your audience may disagree with you. I can empathize with your desire to disagree with me, but here's why it's important to me that I express this. Anyone want to make the argument for high? Um, well, I can make a, I can make an argument for high, although... You know what, let me, let me stop this. Let me just, I like the argument for low. I understand that there's some gray area that we need to control that. If we're really mad, right, if we just completely disagree and we realize that our audience is just not going to hear, we need to be able to say, okay, that's the thing, you know, I was I'm, thinking I'm, if you're in a meeting with CEO of a company, let's say, and you're trying to make a case, a business case, let's say you want some budget or whatever, and but if you see that the other person is not willing to budge from his or her point, I mean, you have to talk it in and you have to say, hey, I need to control my that, that sounds like a high EQ person to me. All right. But someone that just says, I just never express myself because people will disagree with me, that's a low EQ. Uh, I practice activities that help me understand my feelings, such as keeping a diary, talking with friends, etc. Hi, which area? Um, I feel like self-management. So self-awareness. Self-awareness. Self -awareness. Yeah, we need to understand. I find it hard to be patient. No. No. Which category? Same. Okay. Again, everything is a little emotional, uh, everything is a little self-awareness, but I think emotional management is the key for our academic discussion. We hit a little road bump. I didn't get into business school this year. All right, am I going to give up? Or am I going to be patient? Uh, okay, great. So that's a great discussion. I think it seems like a good understanding of how we can take this abstract subject of emotional intelligence and quantify it in things that will be useful to you from a business standpoint and from a social standpoint. We're going to talk a little bit about some techniques you can use to develop emotional intelligence. Before we get to that, we're going to talk about the key, as far as Daniel Goleman is concerned, to controlling emotional intelligence is avoiding what he calls an emotional hijack. This emotional hijack is none other than the fight, flight, or freeze response. Adrenaline goes through your body. You recognize some threat to your physical safety. Let me ask you. This is a natural reaction, which we will experience all the time. You're not a low EQ person just because you go into this reaction. You go into this reaction because you feel scared. The question I want to ask you is, when is this reaction good in the sense that it's going to help you with your social and professional management? When is this reaction bad in the sense that it's going to hurt you? Fight, flight, or freeze. It all happens to us all. When is it good? When is it bad? I think it's good when you're in a, like a, a dangerous situation. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. It's good when you're in a dangerous situation. And by dangerous situation, your physical safety is in jeopardy. You need to lift something.